And welcome back to Cleric Square Ringmail, part three of our new baby call-in extravaganza. Today, we have an exclusive lineup of Jason from Nerds Variety Cast. Jason, take it away. Hey Taylor, Jason here. Interesting last episode. Track and time can be very important, obviously depending on the kind of game you're going to run. But yes, all the reasons you mentioned, except for your Gary Gygax hating, definitely are are valid. Although, to be honest, in in my experience, what we've done in the past typically, depending on the game, is the days between games aren't aren't normally counted as days but normally count as weeks. So if you have, you you know, if you play once a week, then you would have six weeks between the sessions, that kind of thing. And then, you you know, the session is going to be however long, but, and the session time may get accelerated or bumped around depending on what they're doing. You know, if if they rest or, you know, sleep at the end during the session or something like that, you might have multiple days during that couple hour session. Talking about Gary, I think he had a lot of good ideas, and I think he had a lot of good implementations. I'm grateful that he did. While at the hospital lately, I had read through the new Game Wizards book, which chronicles the first Turn decade right or so. Turn right on Avenue. Which chronicles the first decade or so, uh, or two, of the game's existence. It talks about Gary, it talks about Dave, and it talks about all of the other folks that were in the mix. But moreover, it talks about a point in the game's development where Gary stops being a rules guy, where Gary stops playing. And I feel like that's the turning point. The turning point where the game kind of goes astray, the turning point where the company kind of goes astray, that's the point where Gary stopped playing games. That's the point where he was down in Hollywood schmoozing, he was being a businessman and an executive and showing so much growth and uh, taking the world by storm instead of engaging with the hobby that he would claim to have founded. I am truly curious as to how the world would have been different had he never gotten away from gaming and whether even if he was doing the business side there's no there's no reason to say he can't have done the business side. I mean he did for 10 years. But it gets you thinking if Gary had stuck with his role as a creative and gotten away from his role as a salesman and an executive, how different would the game have been? But that kind of ramble could fill up a podcast all its own. So I will leave you with, uh, I don't hate him. Uh, I do think he had some good ideas. I do think he had some bad ideas. And it's important to remember, a stopped clock is always wrong some of the part of the day. I have also played a number of games, especially since joining online games, where time is compressed between sessions, so the next session starts immediately after the first one ended. This often happens where you, you, like say, you're playing an online game, you're only playing two, three hours, and you're stopping during the middle of an adventure, you're stopping in the middle of a dungeon, you're stopping right after a fight. So in that, in those cases... When you come back a week later, you're starting, you you know, immediately after the other session ended. So no time passes between. But the, you you know, if you're playing the, you you know, the the right version of D and D, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which does have training, then it is also very important to track that if you're doing days or weeks between sessions, because of character aging and other effects. Now call me a newbie. But that uh, freezing time, as you describe it, is actually how my experience ran for ages. Uh, before, honestly, that's how my experience ran essentially until I found the uh, OSR. Now, how much of that is related to me 
having started gaming in the 1990s as opposed to starting in the 1980s is up for debate, but I'm curious how much of that is related to the nature of the game. In my experience with freeze time, the reason you freeze time is because why not? You have a set in stone party, you have a set in stone group of players, but in the more sandbox approach and the more West Marches approach, and with open tables, you have a rotating cast. The same people aren't necessarily going to be here next week, and so it's important to accommodate that fact. And at the same time, you, if what happens if it's literally everyone is different? You have multiple parties moving multiple directions, it's important to keep tabs of where they all are. The week per day thing is new to me. Uh, I, I guess it would work based on the necessity of stretching out that much if you're using rules like the natural healing or the rule that shall not be named. To each his own. Um, it's exciting to hear when people, regardless of what they play and how they play, are having those kind of experiences that produce the kind of narrative that we're talking about, even if they're playing in uh, edition that may not be the best, which I think, as everybody knows, is the edition authored by Gavin Norman. So, like in AD&D 1st Edition, you have aging rules, and that'll affect your actual tributes, and it affects other things, so it's important to track these things to determine when your character, you know, passes the next age category. And there are magical effects that'll increase this. Like when you have a haste spell, you age one year. Whenever, anytime a haste spell is cast, when you age one year. So it's important to track these kind of things. As far as training goes, training exists for a very valid reason, uh, which I think you kind of tried to acknowledge in a call to my show, which I'll be playing um, on Wednesday. So what's that? February, I'm in the car driving, looking at the phone like a bad person. February 16th, we'll play a call on my show where you talk about how training might not be as bad as you think it is in this episode. Yep. Training serves as a gold sink. Training serves to improve verisimilitude in the 20-year-old Archmage category. And training serves as a level setter. So you don't necessarily have one character that's level 14 next to another character that's level 2. Uh, the level 2 guy is going to have a little bit of an easier time catching up temporally if you have uh, the level 14 guy have to disappear for a couple months training. So, all in all, serves as an equalizer. One that uh, doesn't necessarily need to exist, but that's the purpose. Why I don't like it, uh, that's food for another episode. All in all, although we, we don't seem to agree on the importance of training, I definitely agree with the majority of your points. And... You know, I think if you're going to play a, a serious game, you're playing a long-term game, that time element's really important. It, or it can be. It, again, it's going to depend. If you're playing one of these, like, like right now I'm in what's projected to be a year, a multi-year game, or yeah, maybe a multi-year, probably a year and a piece game uh, that's a Pathfinder game run by Joe Richter of Sightless. And in that game so far every session because where we stopped because these short sessions is starting immediately after the last one but I'm sure they're going to be because their characters are projected to go from level 1 to 20 I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll have some downtime or some breaks in there I, I guess I don't know I don't know about Pathfinder so I guess I'll find out it sounds like you could use some Pathfinder training in the end don't worry about the sketch like other people said, don't worry about the speed you're putting stuff out. Your family is much more important than RPGs. Take your time. You know, you need the me time, so do your hobby during your me time. You know, when you can squeeze it in, but it's all good, man. We love you. We appreciate you doing what you're doing, and we don't have to agree to, to be there, dude. I'm here for you. So, hang in there. Keep doing the great work. I look forward to your next episode, even if you know, we bump heads here and there on certain subjects, but great job. And last thing on the religion piece, 
I'm not really even comfortable with the, you know, you know, the analogs. Like, oh, this is kind of based on Islam, or this is kind of based on Judaism, or kind of based on Eastern Orthodoxy. I'm, I'm not really comfortable even with that in my games. I like to have elf religions in my games. Noted, and I apologize if I put words in your mouth. Related news, thank you for your support. Thank you for the words of encouragement. Thank you for calling in. No, uh, link in the show notes uh, for all you listeners. That is Jason of Nerds Variety RPG Cast, one of the most prolific of the Anchorites and the member of said community that I uh, tend to refer to as the Anchor Siri, in that you're not really podcasting if Jason hasn't called into your show and, uh, and contributed a positive message. Again, Jason, thank you for calling in and thank you for everything else. But wait, there's more. Between the first episode in this series and now, Jason has called in with some more to say. So, let's hear all that more. Hey Taylor, calling in about your conversation with Daniel. I am not doing a Daniel. I'm calling in after the episode, so I'll probably forget about things. But... As far as having problems with a group wanting to run different systems, I haven't experienced that either. Most groups i played with are very willing to experiment, and if somebody has a game that they really want to try, the other people in the group are happy to do so. I, I think I'm the worst in that category because I know there are some games that Carl wants to run that he's got people to play in that, that I'm not overly interested in playing in. So I guess I'm the bad actor in, in, in our crowd. As far as I'm going to jump around here, Christianity and games and Pendragon. So I bought all the Pendragon books. I'm looking forward to reading and running it at some point. It's a solo game. I haven't got around to it, and I have not decided how I'm going to handle that because I still don't know that I'm fully comfortable with that. So I can't tell you till I read the books. Good, good. Yeah, regarding the Pendragon stuff, uh, I'm going off of instinct on that. I do not own them, nor have I bought them. I will admit to seeing a couple videos on them where people talked about Pendragon, but I haven't watched any actual plays or anything like that, which is normally my go-to on how to get into these kind of games. I'm actually hoping that Arlen will call in. Arlen, you have played Pendragon, I think, and you're also versed in the literature, so hopefully you'll call in, but... Anyway, regarding trying out new games, that makes three of us, at least, who've had groups who are cool about trying new things. And honestly, how do people get into gaming if not for trying new things? But I can vouch there do exist system evangelists, and stop me if I've told this story before, or fast forward, I guess. When I graduated from college, I moved to a town 50 minutes away, and the guys and I kind of fell out, not because I wanted to, but because we weren't that big into VTTs, and the distance was a little intense, and I was working a lot. So after a while, I ended up getting in with a local gaming group, and they played a lot of Pathfinder, also a lot of board games. I think, Jason, you would have fit in really well in that group. An outsider came in at one point onto the forum we were using to communicate and said, I'm interested in running a 3.5 game. This was back when, uh, I think this might have been, no, it has to have been post 4E because I was out of college. This guy wanted to run third, and he invited a handful of us. One of my buddies from college was going to play a sorcerer. I was going to play a paladin. Had this interesting little backstory about being half-orc, but he wore a mask, so no one knew that he was an uh, orcish ancestry trying to overcome his internal chaos, so to speak, the that original sin that comes with his breed. <laughs> play that character in current year. But, so one of the players that he we had engaged on the forum she would not let up on Pathfinder. She was like, Pathfinder does all of the things 3.5 does better. And he goes, well, I like this, this, and this. He goes, well, Pathfinder does that too. Well, this is the... And it was back and forth, back and forth for like a month. And then the guy ended up just ghosting us. He just disappeared. And to, I was disappointed. I was looking forward to playing the game. He and I had gone back and forth about this cool character concept and where we could go with it. And it... It was kind of sad when I think he got uh, bullied out of our gaming group. 
that was years ago. The more common thing, the more common time that I hear that these days is when it pertains to 5th edition. People come in with an expectation that 5th edition is what they just want to do. And I'm not sure if that's because of the hype around a lot of the actual, the big name actual plays. I'm not sure if that's uh, the marketing to the player. So they have their books, they have their character they want to play. The emphasis on story means that they can't take their... Uh, I'm trying to think of a character without being cynical. <laughs> they can't take the character that they came up with and play it in an AD&D game just because it doesn't fit the milieu, whereas it would fit in 5th edition. So there's sort of a system evangelism in that regard. They're only going to play the thing that they want to play. With the advent of mo modern online gaming, it's so easy to find a group. I was in three concurrent games for a while there before my wife threatened to divorce me. That's not true. She did not make that threat, but just in case anybody didn't pick up onto the deadpan humor. The important part is it's so easy to find a game, even in our niche hobby. It's just people are more likely to stick with what they like. I'll give it to them. Uh, I admit that my table might not be for them. As far as party composition goes, D&D just isn't designed to emulate those kind of books, to be honest, that kind of literature. It's interesting. You know, Appendix N is the inspiration for the game, but the game isn't meant to play games in those Appendix N worlds, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's kind of like Goodman games also, to some degree, but Barbarians of Lemuria lets you play in the Conan novels without a problem, or the Conan stories. And that's one of the reasons Barbarians of Lemuria is my sword and sorcery system of choice and the best system i found to emulate Conan. Because you, you can have a party of all warriors and the game works just fine without a problem or, or game or whatever. You, you don't have to have any kind of party composition. Where D&D, &D, especially the later editions, maybe not OD&D &D as much, but especially once you hit AD&D &D, and even in the, the basic versions, it really expects you to have a certain composition. And that's why we just gotta hold off and wait for Daniel to finish his Sword and Sorcery Heartbreaker. In the meantime, I will hope that you run some more Barbarians of Lemuria. That is one of my favorite recaps. Secretly, I will watch actual plays, but I'm not really that big on recaps. Your Barbarians of Lemuria recaps were always the exception to the rule, because I enjoyed those tremendously. Thinking about party comp in BX, etc., it feels like it depends, too, on the game you're trying to run. I mentioned being in three concurrent games at a time. One of those games I'm still in, albeit not as frequently as I'd like, is Jason Hobbs in his Kalmata game. Early on, when I was playing, the player pool, the energy, was a little lower than it is now. Eh, not sure why. It ebbs and flows. But there was always me, the cleric. There was always a thief and or a fighter. And not a lot of magic users. To this day, there's not a lot of magic users in uh, Hobbes' game. And it's probably just dice, because generating 3d6 down the line, there's a chance you won't hit a good intelligence, and that'll kind of push you in a different direction. But... I would like to challenge that you need party comp outside of like OD and D. While it helps, it definitely helps. Uh, and I noticed when we got to play with Baggio for the first time how much help having a decent magic user is. I don't think it's a necessity because we were able to run a handful of adventures. Now we killed a bunch of hirelings, that's for sure, <laughs> and we killed a couple player characters too. But it's it was definitely possible. Because combat isn't necessarily your solution, because combat isn't necessarily your expectation, you're good. you just have to come up with a new way to solve the problem. And truthfully, for that reason, I kind of like running unbalanced parties. You do think outside the box. You do come up with these crazy Leroy Jenkins solutions. And again, it depends on the temperament of the DM. If you've got a harsh GM who doesn't want to play the game nice, he may hose you, but if you've got a cool GM like Hobbs, he will run with what you do and turn it into an awesome experience, rooting for the player, but not playing a biased or bribed referee. Listeners, do you have experiences to the contrary? Let me know.
I enjoy AD&D 1E for various reasons, nostalgia, um, I, I don't know, there are various reasons, but it, it's a very specific game trying to do a very specific thing and expect you to emulate very specific genre tropes that are not the same as literature. Just, just what it is. Um, uh, honestly, I think the most flexible of all the games, without a doubt, that TSR did, the fantasy games, is OD&D. And I really like what Daniel's done with OD&D and Chain Mail. I'm interested to see what you come up with there. But that's definitely the way to go if you want flexibility on character types and all that. All the other games are a little bit too nailed down for me, really. I know in 2E you get specialty classes and all this stuff, but then it gets kind of crazy. And, and now you're in post gygaxian d d anyway, at which point you might as well play something else. So, not I mean, your, your D&D may vary. I've always said that as long as you and your group are happy with the game you're playing, then it's the right game for you. And I'm not saying one version of D&D is better than another. I have preferences, and I have versions I like better than others. But as far as objectively better than others, I, I don't think that's a... I don't know if that's a useful distinction when you're talking about things like abstract games. Because you could take a game that has fundamentally flawed mechanics when you compare it to other games like the math is wrong or you know it's way more complicated to do a certain thing you know it takes 10 actions to do something instead of one in another game with the exact same result but if the group likes that game and has fun playing it then it's not a bad game for that group and yeah you can make some actual objective observances about games but is it worth doing I don't think so anymore to be honest that is a point that we will never butt heads over. If a game works for your table, play it. If a genre fits your tastes, consume it. You don't have to be OSR if you don't want to. And though I enjoy OSR and the OSR experience, I appreciate that it's not for everyone. I may make fun of story games, but I try not to make fun of people. Though I don't anticipate I will be story gaming myself anytime soon, I do detect that now that we are edging back into new normal at home, some of the stressors have gone away, and well, mm, admittedly, last night was pretty rough. The little man decided he needed to stay up till 1 o'clock in the morning. I thought they weren't supposed to do that until they were teenagers, but for all of you who don't have kids yet, that's apparently something they start at infancy, and then they just never stop doing. Well, where was I? The point being, I may not be story gaming anytime soon, but don't let that stop you from doing it if that's what you're into. And now that the stressors of the world, and my life at least, have kind of ebbed, and now that I'm kind of sliding into a new normal, I can feel some of that old congeniality from the first episodes coming right on back. With that congeniality at heart, I want to hear about your games. Not you, Jason, but you, the listener, and Jason, because I know he's listening. I want to hear about your games, I want to hear about your passions, and I want you to talk about things that make you go, yeah. Why is that? Because when you talk about something with a passion, that lends itself towards interest. So story game away, dungeon delve at leisure, and don't forget to post it up for me to see. For me and for the wider community to see. in there. I know you got a lot going on right now in your life. I really appreciate the engagement that you are able to give us. I, I really appreciate hearing from you and interacting with you on the Discord. Someday, our schedules will align. The stars will be right. We'll get to play in a game together. I look forward to that. But I, I wish you and your family all the best. And I hope to talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you very much. I appreciate you tremendously. I appreciate the encouragement. I appreciate that you're there for us. And I appreciate the wash of call-ins that you sent to me this time and in the past and across the Anchor ecosystem. And with that, uh, I do appreciate you calling in. Thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for listening. Uh, this wraps up today's episode. Big kudos to Jason, uh, giving me a whole half hour worth of stuff to talk about today. Looking forward to playing with you one of these days. 
and for you, Jason, and for anyone who's listening. In the meantime, delve on. The Clear Square Ring Mail podcast is an independently owned and operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steal This license, which is kind of like Creative Commons, except f- licensing. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The music for the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast is Gold Coffee by Michael Ramirez C. Retrieved from Mixkit.co and used under the Mixkit royalty-free music license. Sound effects used in the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast are also retrieved from Mixkit.co and used in accordance with the Mixkit-free sound effects license. Clear Square Ring Mail does not describe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by call-ins, guests, or even the host, unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast, you agree to these provided terms. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to reach out to Clear Square email at the prescribed methods provided on the Clear Square email blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg.